Today, we are gonna be talking about the assassination of James Garfield in 1881. I'm going to pull up my screen share here so you all can see some visuals, visualizations of uh, the events in 1881 that we are going to be focusing on. So hold on just a moment as I get that pulled up. All right, here we go. You should all be seeing our uh, first slide today. Uh, and uh, again, my name is Jake Wynn. I am the Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I like to say that uh, I, I get to be uh, in charge of the history at the museum. I get to work with uh, programs um, when we can have them in person, uh, as well as do the social media for the museum. So. Um, myself and a small team work on the social media. So if you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, over on YouTube as well, you should follow us in all of those places. Um, you're going to be interacting with myself and a few of the, the members of the staff at the museum. And I get to help lead all of these great programs for you all that we have enjoyed bringing to you over the last year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is located in Frederick, Maryland. That's who I've worked for since 2013. Um, it's been a, a great uh, almost eight years working with the institution. Uh, we've changed a lot over the years, including this new logo that we brought on board uh, in 2020. Um, that uh, it's a bit of a more modernization of, of talking about what we do at the museum. Uh, we've gone through some, some changes over the last couple of years, uh, including strategic planning that uh, you know made us very much focused on talking about the Civil War medical care in the 19th century and its legacy today. And as I mentioned at the at the open, that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, the legacy of Civil War medicine and how it's going to impact the care for an American president who was assassinated 20 years after the conflict. So I originally came to this story, um, the story of the James Garfield assassination, um, came out of my work at the museum, um, and also through my interest in, uh, and I'm sure many of you out there share this, interest in the events of April 1865 with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, which you will see right here in this uh, illustration. Uh, when Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865, there was very little in the way of infrastructure surrounding the presidency to care for a stricken executive. Uh, he was taken, Lincoln was taken across the street to an, a boarding house um, where he is going to be treated after he is, is shot in the head by John Wilkes Booth. Um, and he received first aid on the floor of the presidential box at Ford's Theater that night. Uh, in working on a blog post about uh, the Lincoln assassination uh, from the perspective of Clara Barton, who's someone we talk a lot about at the museum, we have a museum dedicated to where she lived during the Civil War, which is only three blocks away from Ford's Theater. Um, I found a quote from her April 15th, 1865 uh, diary. That's the day that Lincoln actually succumbed to his wounds. It's one of the most powerful entries in her diary. Uh, and it simply says, uh, after referencing the assassination the night before, she said, quote, no one knows what to do. Um, and what I find remarkable about um, and, and troubling um, is just how little anything changes in the wake of the Lincoln assassination. Um, between April of 1865 and July of 1881, despite the nation's first successful assassination and the loss of Abraham Lincoln, the circumstances surrounding Lincoln's death uh, prevented any significant action being taken in its aftermath. Uh, lawmakers wrote it off as a bitter, as part of the bitter aftermath of the Civil War, and therefore was an outlier. And, and the fear and threat of assassination is not going to be one that is going to be really thought of in the, in the aftermath. There's no infrastructure that's going to be put in place. Very little in the way of presidential protection in the 19th century. Um, just to go through some statistics and some dates here. Um, Secret Service does not begin protecting presidents until after the assassination of uh, William McKinley in 19, uh, in, in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. Uh, you could access the White House very, very easily in the 19th century. You could literally walk in the front door uh, and see the president. Uh, this was a problem for Lincoln that many of you I'm sure are very familiar with of him being uh, constantly pressed by people coming in on business to see him and, and who could come into the White House and, and, and were able to, to gain access to, to the building itself. Uh, and the issue of, of long-term presidential disability uh, 
would not be addressed until the 25th Amendment uh, is adopted in 1967 in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. And, and thinking about what it meant in the 20th century to have a president who in a world in which things could develop and happen very, very quickly, um, that you needed to be able to make changes um, and, and be able to have a leader in charge of the government. So these are some of the uh, shocking things that don't really come uh, about until decades, even a century after uh, the Lincoln assassination. And this is gonna play a role in what happens to James Garfield. Um, so we're gonna be going some pretty bizarre places um, talking about the events of the summer of 1881. Um, but by far the, the most damning part of this story is the medical care that's administered to a stricken president. And, and for those of you who are coming into this with some knowledge about what takes place in the aftermath of Garfield being shot in the back uh, in a train station in, in Washington in 1881, you, you are probably familiar uh, with the medical care that's administered and, and how it is in the end very much a factor in the president's ultimate death. Um, in September of 1881. Uh, despite major advances in medicine in the two decades after the Civil War, uh, medical care in the United States was still lagging behind um, what was going on in Europe, some of the developments that were being made. American medical practitioners, by and large, were fairly slow to pick up on exciting life-saving techniques that were saving lives on the other side of the Atlantic. Now, with that being said, I, I do wanna give a plug to uh, one of the board members of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, Dr. Shauna Devine, uh, who is a, an incredible historian, um, has a great book out there, is working on another great book uh, about, this, about this era of medical history. Um, and she gave me some great advice about this presentation, having seen it two years ago. Um, and I wanna reference that now to say that, uh, um, the events of 1881 and, and the medical care. Uh, it's a very, very important to not uh, give our modern perspectives on this situation and, and look back and add them on say, oh, how barbaric, how uh, ill-informed, how stupid these people were. Uh, important to reference here, and I will do this later, uh, that even though there are new advances being made in the 1880s in regards to medicine, it is still far from proven and American medicine doesn't get as much credit as it actually should uh, for uh, some of the advances that were beginning to take root. However, those uh, innovations are not going to play a factor in what uh, the medical care that James Garfield is going to receive. Um, so most of the surgeons, most of the doctors in America are still going to be relying on the medical care that they, uh, and the knowledge that they gained on the battlefields and in the hospitals of the Civil War. Um, following the assassination of James Garfield in July of 1881, the nation was literally held spellbound, shocked by the news and awaiting every word from a small clique of uh, doctors who surrounded President Garfield. Now, that team was led by a man named Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. Yes, his first name was literally doctor. His parents from the moment of his birth decided that the medical field was the career for him. Um, and so Dr. Willard Bliss or D.W. Bliss um, is going to uh, play a, an important role in this story. Um, he's the man that's gonna become most identified with the medical care. So this is the, gonna be the story of a madman's bullet a doctor's arrogance, and the failure of the American medical community to adapt to the newest knowledge available in the field of medicine and the nature of scientific advancement itself. We're going to be talking about all of those topics over the course of the next few minutes. So let's dive in first to the events of July 2nd, 1881. And then for that, we need to go back just a little bit as well. Um, but let's let's get into the uh, to the events and, and the lead up and actual assassination of James Garfield. As the 4th of July approached in the nation's capital, President James Garfield prepared to board a train for Massachusetts. The 20th president of the United States was 49 years old and a veteran of the Civil War and Washington's political wrangling in the years that followed. He entered the 6th Street Station in Washington on the morning of July 2nd, 1881 in the first summer of his presidency and amid a great tumult in the Republican Party. The political fight that summer was caused by the patronage system, the age old American political technique to shore up political power by giving jobs to your friends. 
Garfield sought to reform this corruption-ridden approach to politics. Others in this establishment, if you will, uh, sought to maintain the system which gave them both power and also wealth. This rift threatened and eventually did uh, drive a wedge in the Republican Party in the late 19th century. So enter in our madman. He is the gentleman right down here. That would be a man named Charles Guiteau. He was a 39-year-old political aspirant, widely known for his instability and seeming insanity. Uh, he tried uh, and failed at uh, law, theology. He briefly lived in a free love religious community and eventually turned to politics. Uh, he was a man who believed that God had a special plan for him. And with the ascendancy of James Garfield, an unlikely ascendancy of James Garfield to the presidency in 1881, he believed he was called to work for Garfield. He wanted to be an ambassador uh, in the seats of power in Europe, um, in, in the palaces of Europe, and he wrote incessantly to Garfield and to other members of the administration uh, to try to shore up and, and gain a position um, as an ambassador. And now the, the guy is very clearly troubled. Um, pretty much everyone that interacts with him comes away with the belief that he is probably insane. Um, he is not right. Um, he, he is ultimately rejected for numerous jobs um, that he seeks to get um, within the Garfield administration. Uh, and when that happens, Guiteau decided that it was God's plan for him uh, to kill the president and to clear an obstacle uh, from his path to political success and, and to be an agent of uh, reuniting the Republican Party during all of this infighting that is going on at the time. So in the summer of 1881, um, and in the late spring of 1881, uh, Guiteau tracks Garfield around Washington, um, tracks him to the railroad station. The Sixth Street Station is where the uh, National Gallery of Art now stands on, on what is now the National Mall here in Washington. Uh, and he brings along a 44 caliber British Bulldog revolver. Um, and, and this is on July 2nd, 1881, but this is not actually the first time that Guiteau is kind of trailing and tracking Garfield. Um, he had been following him for weeks and almost decided to shoot him earlier uh, at, on a previous trip to this train station, uh, but decided not to because Garfield's wife, Lucretia, was there and was not at all well um, as a result of her first weeks living in the, uh, in the White House. More on how, how uh, terrible the White House was to live in in the 1880s in just a bit. Uh, he decided not to shoot Garfield at that time because he didn't want to trouble Lucretia by shooting her husband in front of her. So again, you start to see a little bit of the uh, the mind at work with Gateau is 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 not firing on all cylinders. Um, so as Garfield walked through the train station with his two sons on July second, eighteen eighty one. Uh, he's also walking with the Secretary of State, James Blaine. Guiteau steps forward and raised his pistol and fired. The first bullet struck Garfield in the arm at a glancing angle. It startles the president. He prompt, it prompts him to shout, uh, my God, what is this? But before anyone could react, Guiteau fired what would prove to be the fatal shot, striking Garfield in the back and thrusting him to the floor in agony. Uh, Guiteau was quickly snatched up by an angry crowd uh, who was pretty intent on lynching him uh, for shooting the president, uh, but he was quickly whisked away by a uh, police officer, a, a Washington police officer takes Guiteau away. Uh, a letter found in Guiteau's possession uh, gave the reasons for his actions on this day. Um, he writes, quote, ingratitude is the basis of crimes. I had no ill will to the president. This is not murder. It is a political necessity. It will make my friend Arthur president. That's uh, Chester Arthur, the vice president, and save the republic. I have sacrificed only one. I shot the president as I would a rebel if I saw him pulling down the American flag. And this is where Guiteau is going to largely leave our narrative today. Uh, he is held in a Washington jail cell where he became increasingly unhinged. Uh, he had believed that the nation would understand his actions and that he would be celebrated and ultimately liberated from his prison. Uh, instead, he was nearly killed by one of his guards, put on trial, convicted, and hanged 
on Ju June 30th, 1882, on the eve of the anniversary of, of his uh, actions in the assassination on July 2nd, 1881. Uh, famously, uh, Guiteau, in, as, as a big part of his uh, defense, is going to claim that he did not kill James Garfield, but James Garfield's doctors killed James Garfield. And let's get into that. Let's talk about the aftermath of the assassination and the medical care that is going to be administered uh, to the President of the United States. So, Let's go into the station. This is a photograph on the left of the 6th Street Station, quite an elegant building that no longer stands, um, and an illustration on the right here from the, uh, the immediate aftermath of the assassination. In the moments after Garfield was shot, he lay on the ground in great pain. A woman ra raced to his side, lifted his, lifted his head, and began crying for someone to get him water. This spellbinding spectacle held the entire train depot hostage, and they crowded around the president to see what had happened. One of Garfield's sons burst into tears at the sight of his stricken father and the shock of this very sudden turn of events. Now, James Blaine, the secretary of state, wasn't the only cabinet secretary in the depot at the time. Secretary of War Robert Todd Lincoln, yes, the son of the 16th president, raced to Garfield's side, as did the Postmaster General and the Secretary of the Navy are all in the train station at the same time. Uh, this is not unusual because trains obviously were the chief transportation link out of Washington and everywhere in the United States in the mid 19th and mid and late 19th century. Um, it's like the airports today and you can always run into people and you're always surprised by running into people you know in the airport. Same situation uh, during the mid to late 19th century in the train stations. Not too big of a surprise that you're going to have all of these powerful people in Washington in the same place. Uh, a bystander nearby when the assassination took place recalled, quote, I heard the whizzing of the ball uncomfortably near me. I was not over seven to eight feet from him. Mr. Garfield turned deathly pale and soon after was carried upstairs and vomited. Uh, a Washington Evening, Evening Star reporter uh, documented on the evening of the assassination, he wrote, quote, every garment, even his low quarter shoes was saturated uh, or covered in blood. Within five minutes, the doctors were arriving on the scene. Garfield was moved upstairs to a more private part of the depot under orders from the first doctor on the scene. A dirty horsehair mattress was procured and the president was laid upon it. This is going to be a theme. Dirty, unclean, everything is going to be uh, to be utilized in the treatment and attempted comfort of the President of the United States. So let's look at the first responders who are going to arrive on the scene. These are some of them. There are going to be a, a number of other doctors who are also going to arrive fairly quickly uh, as news begins to spread of the president's assassination. Uh, the first doctor on the scene was Dr. Smith Townsend. He's our mystery man over here to the left. Uh, I have not been able to procure a picture of him, a photograph of him yet. Um, he was a health officer for the District of Columbia. Um, as the president vomited while laying on this bed on the second floor of the train depot, um, Garfield began to drift into and out of consciousness. Uh, this is going to be the first symptom uh, of in the aftermath of the assassination that is going to be treated by Dr. Townsend. This is going to be the first medical care administered. Um, he gives, uh, Townsend gives Garfield uh, some brandy and some smelling salts to bring him back to, to consciousness in order to kind of probe the wounds and, and figure out what had been damaged in the, in the course of the shooting. Uh, this is also standard practice during the Civil War. Brandy um, or whiskey was used as a stimulant um, to, to treat shock. Um, and so this is some of the first, the first medical care is going to be administered is giving a, a shot of brandy, uh, giving some smelling salts and trying to revive him um, out of this state of, of semi-consciousness that the president is in. He then examined the president and determined the location of the bullet's entry and that the bullet was still inside the president. He does not find an exit wound. Uh, this is where things turn ugly. Um, and this is a warning uh, from here on out. There are going to be some 
unfortunate descriptions, um, some graphic descriptions of, of the uh, wounds and medical care that are administered. So if you're squeamish, uh, you've been warned um, that uh, this, this uh, story is one that is particularly gross um, and, and in some cases very disturbing. While Garfield laid on this dirty mattress, uh, the, Dr. Townsend begins to probe the wound with his finger, uncleaned finger. Um, and he digs deep into Garfield's back in search of the projectile. As this is going on, 10 physicians are going to arrive at the scene of the depot. Among them was Dr. Charles Purvis, uh, one of the most interesting characters in this whole drama. He's an African-American surgeon who served during the Civil War. Um, he, uh, he is going to be among the first. He's, he's teaching at, uh, at Howard University in, here in Washington, uh, one of the first African-American colleges in the United States, um, one of the first medical schools uh, for African-Americans in the U.S. as well. Uh, he was a teacher there, uh, pretty well known in Washington as well. Uh, he had become the first African-American to become the head of a civilian hospital in 1881, this very same year. Uh, he first saw his uh, first gunshot wounds during the Civil War, just as many of the other uh, physicians who are going to be on the scene and who were uh, serving as medical practitioners all over the United States, uh, first saw gunshot wounds as a result of the Civil War. Uh, but the man upon who which this story turns is the gentleman on the lower left. Uh, and that is going to be this gentleman here. This is D.W. Bliss, Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. Um, Secretary of War, Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, summoned Dr. Bliss uh, a man he knew and respected from his work during the Civil War. Uh, Bliss was among the doctors who arrived to treat Abraham Lincoln uh, in the aftermath of his assassination in 1865. So this is not uh, Bliss's first assassination. Uh, this is going to be um, something that he has experienced before uh, during the Civil War. Bliss arrived on the scene and immediately took charge of the situation, examined Garfield himself, and began aggressively probing the wound with tools and again with his finger. This is what he says, quote, in attempting to withdraw the probe, this is after he is actually going into the wound in the president's back, uh, the probe became engaged between the fractured fragments and the end of the rib. Bliss actually had to push down on the president's chest, and he has multiple broken ribs as a result of this bullet coming into his body. He had to push down on these broken ribs to actually remove the probe that he had entered into the president's body in search of the bullet. You can imagine how painful that must have been. Now, several of the doctors, including Purvis, uh, are trying to stop Bliss as he's doing it. He continues probing for the for the bullet and, and is going to be continuous, going to continuously fail. Bliss fails to find the bullet despite jamming numerous probes through what he believed to be the path of the bullet. He never finds the lead ball. Garfield's personal physician uh, is this gentleman here. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this. I'm not sure where my uh, head is falling right now uh, on the, uh, the Zoom because uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, but this gentleman in the right-hand corner uh, is... Um, Dr. James Baxter. Now, Dr. Baxter here photographed in his Civil War uniform. This is from the collection of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, Dr. Baxter was one of the most prominent surgeons of the American Civil War, uh, has a long career afterwards as well. Uh, he is Garfield's personal physician and Bliss refuses him access to the president. Um, it gets very heated uh, and ultimately Bliss takes total and complete charge of the president's medical. So that's the situation. That's, this is where we stand uh, in the wake of, immediate wake of the assassination. Let's talk a little bit more about Dr. Willard Bliss. This is gonna be really crucial to our story today. So D.W. Bliss had become quite renowned in Washington as a doctor uh, and had extensive experience during the Civil War. He was a native of Ohio. He knew Garfield, who was a native Ohioan as well, prior to the assassination. He studied at Cleveland Medical College in Ohio, and when the Civil War broke out, became the regimental surgeon of the 3rd Michigan Volunteer Infantry. He later um, is going to, uh, he's going to do so well uh, with the 3rd Michigan that he is going to be appointed as a regular army surgeon, which is a really prestigious position to have. No longer a surgeon of volunteers, but as a surgeon of the regular army. Uh, and he's going to be shipped to Washington 
and he's going to take charge of Armory Square Hospital, which you see in the right hand corner. Uh, Armory Square stands where the National Museum, uh, National Air and Space Museum uh, stands today on the National Mall. So it's very close to the Capitol. Um, it is a hospital that uh, one of the largest and most prestigious of the wartime hospitals in, in DC. He becomes uh, very well respected and helped to oversee the treatment of the wounded in that hospital, which is known as being where the worst cases are often taken because it was closest to the city docks. So as ships are mooring and bringing off wounded soldiers from battlefields like Chancellorsville and uh, Fredericksburg and the wilderness and Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor, a lot of the worst patients end up at this facility and end up under the care of Dr. Bliss. So in the aftermath of the war, though, uh, Bliss gets himself into trouble with the prestigious uh, Organization for Medical Practitioners in Washington. The District of Columbia Medical Society ousted him from their ranks in the 1870s for his support of Black doctors. In this, he, he reached out to Congressman Garfield for support, uh, but failed to regain entry into the organization without disavowing his support for African-American surgeons. Uh, he supported them being allowed, admitted into this organization. So that would actually include Dr. Purvis, uh, who was refused from access to this, to this elite group of doctors in the United States simply because of the color of his skin. Additionally, he has also barred entry for dabbling in a what was a controversial sect of medicine in the 19th century. Um, he experiments with homeopathy, uh, which is a pseudoscience involving the use of diluted, diluted medications and, quote, like cures. So when Bliss decided to come in from the cold, uh, he is... Uh, going to throw away these experiments, uh, both social and scientific, and he's going to strictly stick to the lessons that he learned while working at Armory Square during the Civil War. Uh, he would not be moved uh, by the advent of new scientific uh, and, and medical advances that have been made in the aftermath of the Civil War. Let's talk about those now. So this gentleman on the right is a crucial, crucial, I can't emphasize that enough, crucial to the development of medical science in the 19th century. Uh, this is Dr. Joseph Lister. Uh, and by the time of, of Garfield's assassination, uh, his medical revolution was already sweeping across the world, especially the European continent. His experiments in antiseptic surgical technique uh, had initially been performed in the 1860s uh, as Dr. Bliss was working inside Armory Square. The difference was Dr. Lister was working in Scotland across the, across the Atlantic uh, and was largely isolated from the American medical community. Initially, doctors uh, were pretty hesitant to pick up on Lister's techniques. Um, he, these are viewed as very, very radical. Um, it involves this use of sprayers, like the one you see in the top left, uh, a, a sprayer that would uh, put a diluted stream of carbolic acid over the affected areas. You'd also wash hands, tools, anything coming into contact with the open wound uh, was expected to be affected with this carbolic acid. With this and the advent and acceptance, increasing acceptance of germ theory uh, at this time, Lister's technique slowly became part of, Amer of European medical culture. It was often painful to get it to that point. Lister was ridiculed in the 1860s and 70s for his progressive techniques, but the medical community could not argue with his success. His surgical patients were surviving their operations with shocking regularity. And this pointed to Lister as a genius who deserved awards, not scorn. In America, however, uh, there is, and this is to Lister's frustration in some parts, American medical practitioners were slower to pick up on this. A lot of it has to do with uh, views of, of European everything, uh, very much kind of a, uh, uh, you stay in your hemisphere, we'll stay in ours and manage our own business. Uh, a little bit of the isolationist strain of American thinking here coming in regards to medicine as well. Um, and so there's going to be 
little bit slower to pick up on this. However, there are antiseptic surgical um, practitioners in the United States in the 19th century. You'll hear from one of them in just a bit. Um, so this is very much a battle that is going on in American medicine, just as there were battles going on during the Civil War over techniques and scientific evidence-based medicine was beginning to win out during the Civil War. This is what Dr. Devine, uh, Shauna Devine talks about so eloquently in her book, Learning from the Wounded. Uh, is that scientific medicine was very much advanced during the Civil War. But those battles continue, even after the conflict is over, over uh, what kinds of medicine and how medicine should be practiced, how surgery should be practiced. So should we bring in these new techniques or should we stick with what we used and practiced during the Civil War, our uh, nation's bloodiest conflict? These, this is the battle, these are the battle lines that are drawn um, at the time of, of the Garfield assassination in 1881. So when Guiteau's bullet uh, tears through the president's body, the doctors overseeing his care uh, would ultimately not be using Lister's techniques. They would be using unwashed hands to probe dirty wounds without even the thought of the possible implications. They were adhering to the techniques they used during the American Civil War, and they are not going to be changing their minds despite there being proponents who are saying, please, please wash those hands wash those instruments, and for the love of all that is good, do not continue probing those wounds. So let's get to uh, the treatment that is going to be administered in the White House. So a makeshift ambulance is going to carry Garfield from the train depot on 6th Street to a, a few blocks uh, to the White House. There was a question as to uh, where to transport the president. Or where do you take a stricken president of the United States in 1881? Hospitals were still uh, viewed as very much for the common people, even though they're used widely during the Civil War. They are not thought of as a place you take a prominent member of the American political community uh, for treatment after an assassination attempt. So they're ultimately going to decide to take the president home. However, the White House is not at all a healthy place. Um, and this is, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, the White House is located on, near a marsh on the southern side, on the southern side of this, the lower city, uh, makes it ripe for malaria. It also had a major mold problem and new advances in, in sanitation meant that the house had many working toilets. Uh, but where did all of those toilets get flushed to? Uh, that's right, ancient pipes that led uh, out of the building, which then leaked back into the basement. So this is where the president is going to be brought in the morning of July 2nd, 1881, and where the majority of his treatment is going to take place. Uh, Dr. Bliss immediately takes charge of the president's care, uh, and he is going to summon several doctors he is familiar with, uh, prominent in the American medical community, but who are very much going to, uh, going to back Bliss up and not challenge his by this point, increasingly archaic uh, medical techniques that he's going to be using. Now, as Dr. Devine um, made sure to, to emphasize to me, some of these doctors that I'm going to reference are going to become, uh, and in some cases, we're already beginning to understand the importance of what Lister was doing and what Listerian advocates were, uh, were doing in regards to, to cleaning wounds, uh, using these antiseptic techniques. However, they're not going to be used in the treatment of the president. So these doctors, uh, Dr. David Hayes Agnew, Chief, Chief of Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Frank Hamilton, surgeon at Bellevue Medical College in New York City, James Woodward, president of the Medi American Medical Association, Joseph Barnes, Surgeon General of the US Army, uh, and Dr. Robert Rayburn, professor of anatomy and surgery at Howard University. All of that, these men, have some connections to the Civil War. Um, these are, this is gonna be the medical team that's going to be brought in. You can see them in this sketch um, in the lower part of your screen. This is an elite team in America. Now, these are some of the best known doctors in the United States. However, they're going to largely um, back up Bliss, Dr. Bliss in pretty much whatever he says in the treatments that he is going to prescribe, no matter what their personal views uh, may have been in this situation. An interesting addition to the medical team um, is going to be Dr. Susan Ann Edson, who served as Lucretia Garfield's, the first lady's personal physician. Uh, she also races to the president's side. Uh, Bliss repeatedly tries to expel her, um, and uh, ultimately she stands by 
not as a doctor, but as a nurse uh, over the summer of 1881 as the president uh, and his health continues to decline. Um, an interesting aspect, and this helps to document uh, Garfield's care in the White House, um, as the treatment is, is ongoing, Bliss issues regular press releases to the public. Um, and these start on July 2nd, the day of the assassination. Um, Bliss writes, quote, the president is somewhat restless, but is suffering less pain. Pulse 112, some nausea and vomiting have recently occurred. Considerable hemorrhage has taken place from the wound, referencing all of that blood loss referenced by the Washington Evening Star reporter, the blood that covered all of Garfield's clothes. Um, two days later, uh, Bliss reports, quote, the president this evening is not so comfortable. Not, not a surprise there. Um, he does not suffer so much pain in his feet. Uh, pulse 126, temperature 101.9, respiration 20, 24, and he noted uh, swelling of the abdomen. Uh, a few days later, July 7th, quote, the president has passed a most comfortable night and continues steadily to improve. He is cheerful and asks for additional food. Pulse 94, temperature 99.1, respiration 23. Uh, so you can see in the initial aftermath, Garfield begins to uh, begins a recovery. However, the nature of his wounds, and we'll get into those in just a bit, uh, are going to mean that Garfield likely would never have been able to, uh, to to get back to the lifestyle he had before. These wounds very well may have been survivable, um, but uh, they would have been extraordinarily, extremely painful for the president for the rest of his life. The team continued to regularly probe for the bullet inside Garfield and became obsessed with trying to find it and remove it. Uh, these update, updates published in the press and other interviews conducted by Bliss and his team uh, did alarm the Listerian proponents in the United States. Um, one of them wrote a letter to the First Lady, uh, to Lucretia, urging her to stop the probing for this bullet. They wrote, quote, do not allow probing of the wound. Probing generally does more harm than the ball. Saturate everything with carbolic acid and God help you. Uh, when I came across that account, I, I, I did chuckle. That is a, a great account. Also, uh, they were right, it would have helped in this situation. This advice was ignored. So another um, get into Garfield's condition and his uh, beginning of his decline, uh, he was, it was extremely painful. Uh, and unpleasant throughout this ordeal that the president is going to go through. He vomited regularly. Uh, this was exacerbated by the heavy food he was being given. Uh, he regularly threw up his meals and stopped desiring food altogether. Uh, Dr. Bliss, in an attempt to continue providing sustenance as the president melted away to nothing, uh, began performing rectal feeding uh, four times a day with a mixture of beef bouillon, milk, egg yolk, and a bit of opium. Garfield was 210 pounds when he was shot, a very healthy, a very rigorous man. By the time of his death, he only weighed 130 pounds. Um, it gets to the, the nature of the, of the situation we're dealing with and the ordeal that Garfield went through. The bullet impacted his spine and he could not feel his feet or his legs. Um, everything became miserable for him. And he was regularly in excruciating pain as infection slowly took over his entire body. The president faced infected abscesses throughout his body, including near the path of the bullet and in his salivary glands, where they grew so large as to paralyze his face and nearly kill him by choking on blood and pus when it burst. A little on Dr. Bliss and this infection that is coursing through Garfield's body as the summer goes on. At one point during the course of the president's treatment, he actually cut himself uh, while working near Garfield and got infected material into his own wound. His fingers swelled to be so large that it required Dr. Bliss to wear a sling for his entire arm. So this is the infection that is, again, coursing through Garfield's body. Dr. Bliss told the American public through everything um, that was happening inside the White House that things were going well uh, and that the president was recovering even as he languished and his body is visibly uh, beginning to break down. Now enter kind of a, a strange aside in this story. Um, talk about this guy. Uh, this is Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, maybe familiar with him and uh, a cartoon version of, uh, of Garfield laying on the bed. 
Um, this is about the search for the missing bullet. Um, Bliss became so desperate to find the bullet that he called on the inventor of the telephone to come and utilize a new machine he invented just weeks before the assassination. Um, the induction balance device was a crude metal detector. Uh, and he was called in to test this device upon the president. On uh, late July, this, this is when this takes place, um, he, Bell writes, quote, it made my heart bleed to look at him and think of all he must have suffered to bring him to this. So you can see by late July, things are beginning to decline. Um, Bell's machine failed to work properly, however, and the bullet was not located. Bell wrote, quote, I feel woefully disappointed, disappointed and disheartened. He never again had the chance to test it on the president. Uh, Bell blamed the malfunction on the brief time he had to assemble the machine before the test began, and also for the metal springs in the bed that threw off the, the machine's delicate balance. So again, brief aside there, kind of scientific uh, advancement being made during the course of this, uh, this story. Now for the newspapers, this side of the story. Uh, throughout the summer, newspapers were obsessed with this story. This is literally the biggest story in America. Updates from Bliss and his team were regularly published and made the public largely believe that the president would recover and, and that he would likely recover. He would get better. But by August, things began to look increasingly bleak and Bliss clamped down on access to the president in order to suppress the fact that Garfield was declining. Um, just a kind of dis description of what this looks like outside the White House um, as reporters are waiting for, for these updates from Bliss. Um, someone writes, quote, the bulletin throng that nightly, um, there is a bulletin throng that nightly gathers at the gate to the White House waiting for the official report. Um, as it becomes clear that things are going downhill and stories begin to leak out, um, by late August there are definitely skeptics of Dr. Bliss. Um, and uh, one of these here, um, yes, you see over here, uh, Bliss the Buoyant um, is, is how one newspaper uh, puts it. Um, so, so the American public is becoming increasingly aware as the summer goes on that the situation is deteriorating. Now this is from a, one of the illustrated magazines at the time. It depicts kind of the last um, journey of, of President Garfield. Um, as his condition worsens, uh, in, as we head into September of 1881, uh, there's a last ditch effort uh, to, to try to save the president's life, um, try to increase the surroundings, get him out of the unhealthy environment in the White House. And they ultimately decide upon um, taking him to a cottage at the seashore. Uh, Garfield uh, grew up um, and, and spent a lot of time on, on canals uh, in and around uh, Ohio, where he grew up. And so he was very fond of the sea, um, very, very much interested in, in, in the ocean, uh, in the lakes, the Great Lakes as well. And so they thought that uh, he should go to the ocean. Um, if, if not, you know, a last ditch effort to save his life, um, but also to give him some measure of comfort in, in the course uh, if he should succumb to his wounds. Um, they're going to take him to Elberon, New Jersey. In uh, September 5th, 1881 is when they're going to make this, this journey out of the White House. Uh, the train was specifically equipped to minimize bouncing and shifting to try to give the president some comfort. You can see it in the illustrations here. Uh, they have the mattress placed upon other mattresses um, to try to, uh, to, to minimize the amount of bouncing as the train traveled. Uh, they clear all of the other trains between Washington and New Jersey. Um, all other trains are sidetracked to give the president uh, in, in this train uh, unfettered access to get to the coast as fast as possible. Um, and they couldn't get the train uh, to the cottage where the president was going to, uh, to, to, to attempt to recuperate. Uh, and so you see this image here. Um, of here in the corner, uh, they actually built 3,200 feet of extra track to bring the train basically right onto the beach, um, right to the cottage. Um, as the, the, the train actually had to be pushed up a hill, the car had to be pushed up a hill to get to the, uh, pushed up a bluff to get to the cottage itself. Uh, initially, things get better because of the change of scenery. Uh, Garfield says, quote, this is delightful, it is such a change. Um, in the aftermath of, of being brought to the shore. He rallied, but ultimately was too ravaged by infection. Uh, Elberon, New Jersey, September 19th, 1881, 6 p.m. 
Though the gravity of the president's condition continues, there has been no aggravation of symptoms since the noon bulletin was issued. He has slept most of the time, coughing but little and with more ease. The sputa remains unchanged. A sufficient amount of nourishment has been taken and retained. Temperature 98.4, pulse 102, respiration 18. Then the final bulletin that is going to emerge from, uh, from Bliss. This is Elberon, New Jersey, September 19th, 1881, 11.30 p.m. The president died at 10.35. After the bulletin was issued at half past five this evening, the president continued very much in the same condition as during the afternoon. The pulse varying from 102 to 106 with rather increased force and volume. After taking nourishment, he fell into a quiet sleep. About 35 minutes before his death and while asleep, his pulse rose to 120 and was somewhat more feeble. At 10 minutes after 10 o'clock, he awoke complaining of a severe pain over the region of the heart and almost immediately became unconscious and ceased to breathe at 10.35. This last announcement is, uh, is put out by uh, a trio of doctors at, at Garfield side, uh, Dr. Bliss, also Frank H. Hamilton and D. Hayes Agnew. Uh, we mentioned them a little bit, little bit earlier. His last words were reportedly, uh, this pain, this pain, referring to the pain in his chest he was feeling um, as, as he died. The fate that had claimed so many soldiers during the Civil War, infection, not the wounds themselves, but the infection afterwards, claimed James Garfield. And Dr. Bliss was now going to be at the center of a medical firestorm. The autopsy. Um, Garfield is going to undergo an autopsy. This is something that becomes very common as a result of the Civil War. Well, was not so before the Civil War. Civil War very much changes the way American science looks at bodies, uh, this, uh, raise, this rise in scientific evidence-based medicine. They, they want to learn from these terrible, terrible situation and terrible events. So they're going to perform an autopsy just as they did on President Lincoln in the aftermath of his assassination in 1865. So Dr. Woodward and Dr. Lamb from the Army Medical Museum in Washington, this is now the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Um, they have retained all of the collections of the Army Medical Museum, headed the autopsy of James Garfield on September 20th, uh, 1881, the day after Garfield's death. They searched for the bullet now that the president had expired and found its hiding spot. The bullet had fractured the 11th rib smashed into the lumbar vertebrae and come to rest behind the president's pancreas. The bullet rested on the left side of Garfield's body. Dr. Bliss and his team had convinced themselves that it was on the right side of his body. The consistent probing of the wound had actually created a new channel through Garfield's body, completely separate from where the bullet came to rest. And through this channel, infection swarmed throughout the president's body. Now, arguments over the president's death, some pointing, uh, arguments continue. Um, some pointed to the rupture of an infection within his body that led to his death or whether a heart attack had claimed the president's life that night. Uh, that battle actually uh, went over into the press as well, this fight over what actually killed the president. Keep in mind, Guiteau is also aware of this, and this is why this battle and fight over the medical care that was administered is ultimately why he's going to make it a linchpin in his unsuccessful uh, defense uh, in an attempt to save his life um, that, as I mentioned, is unsuccessful. He does, is ultimately executed for, for the crime of killing the president. Uh, Bliss goes on the record uh, and uh, he uh, tries to spin his own PR, which, uh, is largely unsuccessful. Uh, he says, quote, the record which I wish to make now is not that of the surgeon so much as that of a man who loved his patient. The official and professional reports are presumably complete. There can be little to add to save them, save what unprofessional criticism may furnish. So uh, Bliss is going to go before the press, publish his own writings, uh, trying to uh, vindicate himself uh, and, and his tactics and his techniques, uh, as well as his uh, media strategy as well. Um, they aggressively defend themselves in the aftermath of the president's death. Um, and as President Chester Arthur begins his term, uh, 
Bliss, again, loses this public relation battle. His name becomes kind of synonymous with, uh, with failed medical practice in the 19th century and, and his uh, probing of the wound, the unclean instruments, all of this is gonna be grist for the mill of, of modern myth-making. Um, and uh, Bliss is going to uh, not look good to history as a result, um, even though he was, again, an extremely well-respected physician in the mid-19th century, dating back to the Civil War and his service at that time. Ultimately, the death of James Garfield is a sort of turning point in American medicine. While the team of doctors worked on the stricken president, uh, they would continuously con maintain that they did everything they could Around them, even as they are treating the president, American medicine was already beginning to change. Uh, the success of Joseph Lister and his proponents in saving lives using this Listerian method, spraying everything with carbolic acid, um, does catch on in America in the 19th century, came to a close. And American medical expertise is actually going to be really uh, increasing at this time. Um, soon American doctors were the one making, uh, making medical advancements um, unlike anything seen before. Now, as for Garfield, um, this is kind of how I got into this story in the first place. Um, it is one of the saddest chapters of American history. He's a young president, he's only 49, had a chance to make sweeping changes across America in the aftermath of the Civil War. Garfield's death was unnecessary. I mean, you have to say unnecessary and represent how American conservative American medicine was still hanging on after the Civil War. Uh, and this is going to mark a turning point where we turn a corner in American medicine. Um, and, uh, and, and this kind of embarrassing situation of the president dying as a result of the medical treatment being administered to him. Um, progress is, is going to be made afterwards. New science had been ignored will be paid attention to in the aftermath of this situation. Uh, it shocked the American medical community, especially the infighting that takes place afterwards. Uh, and these new developments are going to be able to uh, be going to begin to, to take root, as I have already mentioned. In the 1880s and the 1890s, uh, major advances are going to be made in American medical schools. Uh, that's going to last into the 20th century and continues right up to the present day. The United States was on the path towards becoming a medical superpower. Um, but alas, for President James Garfield, it all came too late. So that's going to conclude my part of the program today. Um, thank you all for watching uh, with me. Um, I'll now take a look over at the comment section here. Um, I, before I do that, I, I do want to uh, just make a kind of brief aside here um, to see, wow, we have uh, almost 300 people watching right now, which is fantastic. Um, do want to, uh, to, to give a shout out um, uh, to someone it's very, very important uh, to me. Um, I learned last, uh, last evening that my uh, grandfather um, passed away um, as a result of a, a long illness um, and uh, just felt that it was appropriate to, to give this presentation today kind of in his memory. Um, he was a big part of getting me into history um, as many mem members of my family uh, were a big part of that. Um, and so uh, I just want to kind of dedicate this, this presentation to him. It's one of my favorite programs to give for the museum. Um, and uh, I thought that, uh, that sticking with the schedule today, even though uh, it's a pretty sad time for, for me, for my family, and I know out there for many of you as well, um, that, uh, that this would be a great tribute to him. So um, I, I want to dedicate this to, to my grandfather father. So um, thank you again all for watching today. I'm um, going to go into the comments section now and see what we uh, see what we have here. Um, going through um, lots and lots of questions. Um, go through here. Dr. Doctor. Yes, Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. Uh, quite a name. I always love uh, giving this presentation to because uh, that always gets chuckles as well. It is quite uh, quite a name. Um, to see all the folks tuning in. Thank you also for, for watching uh, today. Uh, and as my colleague John mentions here uh, in the comments section, uh, if you did join the presentation late, um, we will be, this will live forever here on the Facebook page. Um, we'll also be published over on our YouTube channel as well. Um, you can subscribe over there. We have more video content over there and available as well. 
Um, uh, do we know what Garfield actually died from? Uh, heart attack or, or multi-system organ failure? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Lynn, thank you for your comment. Um, this question is one that lingers uh, and, and is one that hasn't satisfactorily been answered and can't be satisfactorily answered. Um, just like so many, um, you know, looking back over, over illnesses in the past and diseases and, and what killed historical figures, we can give assumptions, we can give some evidence-based, uh, you know, theories, but we can't prove it, um, unfortunately, because uh, we don't have access to all of the information that is available. So we can have suppositions, we can, we can theorize over what it was, but we can never confirm it. Um, I, I would say from looking into this story and reading over the, uh, the, the uh, autopsy paperwork and, and looking at what they said about this, it really has to do, it's, it's a combination of, of just how weakened his body had become with all of these infections that are coursing through, um, coursing through, the, through the president's body um, that all kind of all together, this combination of the wounds, the uh, aftermath, the lack of nutrition, uh, everything kind of comes together uh, to to uh, lead to the president's ultimate death. Um, now, I have a unique problem here for you all. There are so many of you here and so many comments that I can't see all of them. So um, if you do have questions, uh, you might want to drop them back in because I can't actually go back and access them all. Um, so if you have any burning questions about this topic, please go ahead and, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, drop those into the comments section again and I can get to them. Um, thank you all so much for watching and seeing, seeing all the thank yous and, and, uh, and condolences as well. Um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the kind remarks, uh, means a lot to me. Um, wasn't uh, Mrs. Garfield's cousin a doctor that supported Lister's germ theory? Yes, um, another one of the doctors who was, um, I can't remember his name at the moment, um, not in my notes, unfortunately, um, but was a part of the team that was trying to get access uh, to Garfield because they understood that the situation was worsening. Um, Lucretia, uh, the president's wife throughout this situation is very much aware um, that the president situation is declining. She's watching her husband waste away. And so she's increasingly desperate to try to get um, a change. And, and she's going to play a big part in getting the president out to the seashore as well, um, is going to get her, get uh, Garfield out to, to New Jersey um, because the situation was worsening. Um, yes, uh, was a supporter of the Listerian method. Um, and you can imagine his horror at, uh, at watching this situation devolve the way that it did. Can you, uh, was there any treatment for infection? Uh, this is a that's a great question, uh, Mary Ellen. Um, this is a great question. There, there, not so much the actual infection um, because uh, those medications aren't going to be developed until until much much later. Uh, what doctors in the 19th century would do is treat symptoms. So um, they would try to they could try to stop the spread of infection. Um, during the Civil War, they use um, multiple kinds of forms of acids to do that, diluted acid, That's similar to uh, the kind of carbolic acid mixture that, uh, that, that Lister is going to prove uh, and utilize in his method uh, to, to stop certain forms of infection from spreading. Um, hospital gangrene is one of, those, uh, illness, one of those infections during the Civil War. But unfortunately, with the knowledge that is available in the mid 19th century, uh, there wasn't a, a way to really effectively treat, treat infections, um, manage the symptoms, manage the situation to try to allow the patient to survive it of their own accord. But unfortunately, because the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding of how disease actually functioned, there's very little that they could do. And if a patient recovered, it was oftentimes um, because they could of uh, their body was rigorous enough uh, they, they they were strong enough to be able to to uh, their own immune system could could overwhelm and, and ultimately uh, help them survive the wounds this is why it became so crucial in the listerian method to prevent infection in the first place because if you could prevent it we have this way of preventing it from taking place um, you you don't have the the as much of a risk um, as a result uh, in the aftermath of the surgery 
Um, do you want to throw a, a shout out if, if you did enjoy today's program while we still have uh, 220 of you here, uh, please go into the comment section. I believe it's probably a pinned comment. Uh, become a member of the museum, support these programs. I get to do this research uh, and all of this work because I am supported by the museum. So if you like these programs and the research we're doing and the programs we are performing, please consider becoming a member today. Um, that is a, 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 ba a big way that you can, uh, you can all help us. I, I see we do have uh, some new memberships that came in um, while we were doing this program. So I'll give a shout out to, uh, to Lori. Thank you for becoming a member during today's program. Um, and uh, another one here, thank you to, uh, to Ferris for also becoming a member. So if you didn't support the program today, please consider becoming a member. You can go to civilwarmed.org uh, slash support slash member to become a member today. Uh, Cindy, uh, what exactly was the path of the bullet? What happened to the assassin? So I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the presentation, which again, you'll be able to go back and watch um, afterwards. Um, the path of the bullet, uh, he shot originally in the hand, uh, first bullet, uh, then he shot in the back, it goes through um, into his back, it's going to strike his ribs before uh, actually uh, impacting his vertebrae and, and landing behind uh, his pancreas. And that's where the bullet will hide until the autopsy is performed a, a day after his death. Um, continuing on, thank you all again so much for watching. Thank you for the condolences as well. Um, did Dr. Lister create Listerine? Uh, great question. Uh, no, uh, but it is named in his honor. Um, because of, again, his, uh, his, his method is, is very much uh, uh, another question about Listerine as well, um, because he was uh, arguably the most famous medical mind of the 19th century. Uh, he's going to have a lot of uh, those, uh, th those things are going to be named for him and kind of in his honor. Uh, can you give a mention on Robert Lincoln's tie to the first three presidents to be assassinated? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, for uh, Lincoln, um, Lincoln, his father, he is is there in the aftermath and is there as he's dying of his wounds. He's present for Garfield's assassination. And then he's also serving in the cabinet of William McKinley, I believe, uh, when McKinley was assassinated. Uh, someone else can quote me on that. I'm not as much of an expert. I'm not an expert at all on Robert Todd Lincoln, um, but a, a very prominent character um, in the uh, in, in 19th century American politics, uh, though overshadowed, of course, by by his father. Um, just got another uh, little ding here. So thank you to Patrick for becoming a member. Uh, thank you for supporting our programs today. Big, big shout out to you. Thank you uh, for, for supporting. Uh, could you please list all of the doctors who worked for him on the, on the platform? Um, I will be able to put that, Natalie, in the comments section afterwards. It'd be better to have them written out for you all. Um, I can put those there. Um, Cindy, oh, what happened to the assassin? Sorry about that, Cindy. Um, Guiteau is executed um, in June of, of uh, 1882, so about a year after uh, the assassination, he is uh, hanged. Um, his defense, though very novel and memorable, um, because he blamed the doctors for uh, Garfield's death and said that he shouldn't be executed for killing the president because he didn't kill the president, the doctors did, that defense did not work, though it is very, very memorable. Um, continuing on, Dr. Boynton. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for drop, dropping that in as the the, the cousin um, that uh, that that was a Listerian uh, proponent and doctor. Was Dr. Bliss allowed to continue practicing medicine? Yes, yes, he continues practicing medicine, though uh, there is a stigma associated with Dr. Bliss uh, for the remainder of his career. Um, that stigma lives on, though I believe it is a uh, kind of a, uh, apocryphal story. Uh, the term ignorance is bliss has very much been attached to his name, whether or not that is actually the origin of that, uh, I'm not an expert there, um, but uh, I've had multiple people over the years bring that up um, in regards to, to the situation. And so in a popular American memory, um, the term and the, 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 the use of ignorance is bliss has been used in connection with, with Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. So yeah, his legacy has been forever marred um, by the couple of months he oversaw the medical care for, for, for James Garfield. And continuing on here, um, Lister is in Listerine. Yep, got that one. Um, 
Hey, there you are, Patrick. I see you in the comments. Thank you for becoming a member. Uh, David Gray, are these recorded? Yes. Um, I have a few more questions I'll answer before I jump out here. Um, and this is this is a good one. Uh, these videos do stay on our Facebook page. So if you missed the beginning, you can go back uh, and, and watch it here on Facebook. Um, also be uploading it to YouTube as well. Uh, you can subscribe and follow and like us on all forms of social media. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, um, and you can find links to programs and posts and photos and all of the things that we do here at the museum. So we have another question related to the museum. Um, and this is from Barbara. Where is the National Museum of Civil War Medicine? Uh, we are located in Frederick, Maryland, um, with very uh, close ties to Antietam Battlefield, Gettysburg, uh, Harper's Ferry, uh, Washington, and Baltimore. Frederick's right smack dab in the middle of that. Uh, we also operate a museum here in Washington, D.C., the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, uh, and we operate a museum on the Antietam Battlefield, the Pry House. Um, and another great question, uh, are you a physician? I am not, I am but a humble uh, public historian. Um, I do have a, a history background as well as uh, communications and uh, in kind of social media marketing background is, is my, is my um, uh, you know, educational background. So no, not a, a actual doctor. Get to work with a lot of great physicians and dentists and surgeons uh, in the military, out of the military, uh, but I myself am not. So um, thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, please consider developing a presentation for the Lister method. Great, uh, great program idea. I know that there are uh, museums out there, especially across the pond in England, medical museums over there that do a great job talking about Lister and his work. Um, so I'd advise, uh, you know, if you like medical history, there are so many great medical sites out there that are doing some great work during the pandemic. Um, check them out as well. Uh, might go ahead over into the comments after this and, and put some of those in there. Uh, on. Do you think Dr. Bliss, that Bliss is persistence in not allowing others who had better knowledge or more updated medical practices and treatments was partly because of the earlier involvement, the fact they weren't able to save Lincoln. That's a good question, Ray. That's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the initial out, um, the, the initial bliss of effort to kind of close out everyone else comes from his I'll unabashedly say this, it was kind of a public relations grab. He, he thought that there would be a lot of prominence that would come with being the president's personal physician during this uh, dangerous time. I think not understanding the implications for himself and his legacy if things would go wrong. And, and he begins to realize that as the treatment actually is, is happening and the president begins to decline, realizing the terrible situation he's put himself in. And he closes himself off even more. And we know, you know, these kinds of efforts, these public relations efforts oftentimes can, uh, uh, can, can turn uh, on, on those who are carrying them out. You know, if people who are you know, lacking transparency can lead to these sorts of things where all of a sudden it appears like, oh, wow, you are lying to us. Um, and that's where bliss kind of falls into, definitely falls into trouble. I'm not sure so much, it doesn't come from the fact that they could save Lincoln. Um, the medical knowledge and the, the, the treatment available, even in the 1880s, the, the president, President Lincoln would not have survived his wounds had he been, uh, had Garfield suffered similar wounds, it would not have been a survivable injury uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, so I don't think that that would have been too big of a factor. Um, what was the name of your colleague who wrote the book on medicine during this time? This is a great question, Lori. This is Dr. Shauna Devine. I'll make sure we get the link uh, to her book, Learning from the Wounded, um, in, into the comment section in response to your comment. Um, uh, Dr. Devine is a board member for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. She teaches at a university in Canada um, and is in amazing, amazing resource uh, for me personally, um, I, which I'm very thankful for, uh, but also for the, the medical community, medical history community out there at large. She is a, a wonderful, wonderful scholar um, and doing some, some great work. All right, everybody, I know I still have some questions here um, and uh, appreciate them, um, but I have gone over, I'm coming up on the end of my time here. Um, so I want to, uh, 
to, to thank you all so much for tuning in today. Um, I'm going to get to as many of the questions um, as I can in the comment section in the days to come. My colleague, uh, John, who has been so faithfully through me through this with me on, uh, on in the Facebook comment section and, and moderating. Thank you so much, John. I know you're I know you're listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, too. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, if you did enjoy the program today, if you haven't yet liked the video, share the video. That helps us um, to, uh, to, to get more people, reach more people, get more people involved and interested in this history. Um, I do have a few final shout outs here. If, if you like the video, please consider becoming a member of the museum. We have a couple of those coming in right now. So I'll give some shout outs to Terry. Thank you so much for becoming a member during this presentation. Uh, thank you to Regina as well um, for becoming a member. And finally, at this point, thank you to Colby uh, for becoming a member. And I, I just spoke to Colby uh, earlier this week. Thank you so much for tuning in, Colby. Appreciate you. Looking forward to working with uh, Bentonville Battlefield uh, down in North Carolina. Looking forward to working with you all um, down there. That is fantastic. Uh, we'll give shout outs uh, to anyone who becomes a member. Um, we'll give shout outs into the comments section after this stream is over. Um, but this is going to conclude today's program. You can join us next week. We have a couple of great programs lined up um, that are, are going to focus on different elements of Civil War medicine. Uh, hope you will tune in for that. Uh, like us, subscribe, um, you know, follow us on all social media. It helps us. And thank you so much for being here and for the great comments. Uh, we'll see you next week. Hope you all have a great weekend. <laughs>